introduce myself briefly and then we'll pray. My name is Michael Danzi and born and raised in London, South East London. My home church is Lewisham Seventh-day Adventist Church. Um, the high day of being at Lewisham Church is when I was baptised May 27th, 1999. Amen. We hear it so much sometimes we don't really realise or we forget how significant that was. I was baptised May 27th, 1999. Amen. That's why I'm still here, Amen. by the grace of God. And so my wife is here with me. Um, she's not feeling too well because we're expecting our third child. Amen. Come on, guys. Are we tired? I'm taking the crust out of our eyes. I've had our wheat a bit. So she's in the chalet. I'm here with my two children, Isabel, Solomon, our brother, friends and family. And um, I now live in Birmingham. And so that's where I'm at the moment. That's about it. So let's just have a word of prayer. Bye, heads with me as I just live. Father in heaven, I need your Holy Spirit. Because Father, it's only him that can speak to our hearts. Father, it's only him that we need to live the life that you want us to live. Father, it's through him that the chains that may be holding us can be broken. Father, it's only through him that Satan trembles. So Father, I need your Holy Spirit right now to make this word clear and simple. Bring back things to my remembrance. I pray your people may be revived. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The title of my presentation is When the Devil What? Trembles. I'm going to ask you a question. And please do not think that this question is a kindergarten question. How many of you believe that the devil actually is as real as I am on this pulpit? I'm sure all of us will put up our hands. If we don't put up our hands, we say definitely. This presentation is going to challenge you to really understand who we are dealing with. We are dealing with somebody who if given the opportunity, given the time, he will annihilate you on the spot. Isn't that why Christ said in Matthew 16, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I want to be a part of that church. I want to be a part of a church that makes the devil tremble. I want to be a part of that church that when we speak, when we minister, the devil trembles. I want to be a part of that church that like Christ, when he stepped into a synagogue, the devils had to declare, this is the son of God. He said, be quiet. I'm preaching. I want to be a part of that church that when we pray for devils to leave, they leave. We don't say as a cliche, we know it happens because we have an experience with the spirit of God. Amen. So I'm going to tell you a story. Because we say we believe that the devil exists. But ask yourself the question, if, he, if you really understood what he's capable of, what he wants from you, how would you live your life from day to day? I'm not talking about fear. I'm not talking about fear. I'm just talking about in the light of what our Savior has told us about him. There's a gentleman at my brother's workplace, and his name is David Phoenix. And I'm not sh can't remember if he watched the big question, 
a TV program on BBC One, myself and my bro were on that program. And many were upset because I held my hand up for a whole hour and they never took my hand. And so this caused a conversation between David Phoenix and my brother. And David Phoenix made a statement that caused my brother to be shocked. This guy is not a Christian. He doesn't believe in God. My brother was recounting to him a, 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 a statement that was made by someone who doesn't believe in God on the show. Doesn't believe in the spirituality. Doesn't believe in the existence of spirits and the spiritual world. And this guy said, that's total rubbish. My brother was shocked. This guy's not a Christian. But he said, it's rubbish to not believe that there is a spiritual world as real as this platform that I'm standing on. My brother said, what do you mean? You're not, you, how do you know the spiritual world exists and there are spirits? He said, because I'm a spiritualist. This is a young man. And I'm going to tell you the story that he told my brother. To paint the picture that there are people who do not believe in the Bible, who do not sit down in these seats and praise the God of heaven, but they know that there is a spiritual world and it's as real as flesh and blood. He says, this is how I came to believe in spirits. Satan, now let me make this statement quickly. Satan is trying to convince his people as much as we should be convinced about what they're convinced about. Did you get that? Yeah. So, prepare for the story. This guy says, I don't believe, I know there's a spiritual world. Satan is trying to get that conviction because he knows when that conviction takes the soul of somebody, they're not going nowhere. Because now it's not a theory, he knows. Because he went through a experience. Though false we may say, though false we may know from scripture, though not genuine, he knows it because he saw something and he heard something. So he has a conviction that's not moving him presently at the moment. So he said, Jonathan, let me tell you, we went on this witch hunt. No, not witch hunt, what was it again? Like a haunted hunt. You know we have these programs on TV, um, haunted house, and they go through the forest, and, or they go to this house that's supposed to be haunted. It was one of those, this kind of trip that he went to, a haunted trip. They got to this house, and then there was a medium there who is supposed to be speaking to those who have died. And while he's doing his thing, they're there in this house. And all of a sudden, it was pretty dark, but you could still see everybody. It was quite clear. A chair's a chair, a table's a table. A darkness started to fill the room. The darkness was so black, he said, when it consumed the whole room, you couldn't see your hand in front of your face. He says, from that moment, I was convinced there were spirits. Second experience. He was staying in a hotel with his father on holiday. And he woke up and he could see a man standing at the end of his bed, dressed in black, tall, towering over. And he made sure he wasn't dreaming. And this man began to float just above him. And he said, he screamed like he's never screamed before. And he was trembling in the side and the corner of his room. And as this man was there, he was communion. Com he was talking to his father as I'm talking to you. And his father said, don't worry, David. It's okay. We're talking. David turned on the light. And as the light turned on, imagine these lights are bright. You can't see how bright they are because you're behind them. But these are bright lights. Imagine when you turn on the lights, guess what happened? The light from the light bulb left the room. Let me repeat that again. You turn on the light. This man is floating at the end of his bed. And the light from the light bulb left the room. 
can't even fathom that in my mind. But this is what he says. He says, John, I know there are spirits. Let's turn our Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, where the theme of our topic comes to our attention. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and it's in this chapter that I got the inspiration for the title of this presentation, When the Devil Trembles. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Is everybody there? Amen. If you have your phones, your Bibles, whatever, make sure you turn into 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We're going to start reading from verse 3, and we're going to home in on verse 4. The Bible says, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are what? Lost. In whom the what? The God of this world hath done what? Blinded the what? The minds of them which what? Believe what? Not. Quick question. Who can Satan blind according to this text? According to the text, who can Satan blind? Those who don't believe. Okay. Now. What's that next word? If you have a KJV, what's that next word? Lest. You might have another version. What, what, if you have another version, what's that next word? Sorry? So, now watch this. The word lest is far more significant than the word so. It can convey the same idea and it wouldn't be wrong. But let's finish reading the text and it would have come back to this word lest. In whom the God of this world hath done what? Blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the what? The light of what? The glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should do what? Shine where? Unto them. So, the God of this world has blinded the what? The mind. He's blinded the mind of them which don't believe. God wants us to comprehend something. God wants us to understand something. And Satan doesn't want you to comprehend that something. Why? The text tells you, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, what's that next word? Less. Text on the screen. That, you see those three words on the screen, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 3? When you look at that word less, exactly the first definition in your dictionary, it should be for fear that. And my dictionary said this, listen, listen, my dictionary told me this, this word less is often an expression used denoting fear or apprehension. Let me say that again. Often an expression used denoting fear. Fear, F-E-A-R, when someone is petrified or apprehensive. So let's read the text again to squeeze out the juice, the power, the promise in this verse. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not for fear that the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should do what? Verse 4 tells you who are lost, so don't twist this text. Those who don't believe. This is why I asked you, do you believe that the devil exists? But that's not going to save you. I just set that foundation to make you understand what we are dealing with. And now we have, from inspiration, something that's more powerful than the devil. Something that literally, when it's presented, he's quaking in his boots. I don't care if you don't believe it. Because I'm going to finish with a testimony where it's going to show you, convince you. I don't care if you leave this camp meeting, not changed. I don't care if you don't make a decision. That's not my prerogative. One thing is to make you understand and to tell you the truth, to inform you that there's something more powerful. Something more powerful than the devil and his temptations. Something so powerful, right now, most of you were late at 9.15. If we believed who we were dealing with, we would be up 
at five in the morning, praying our hearts out. I said to a teenager, a good friend of mine, he said, what time's your devotion? I said, 9.15. He said, oh, man. But in love, I said to him, if there was a thousand pounds on that table, you'd be there. He goes, you're true, man. True said, true words. He goes, yes. We have to exhort one another in the times that we're living in. There's no time for no wishy, washy, smooth talk. Because that devil has been the same when he, when he planned to take down our first two parents. He's the same arch enemy. He's the same cunning, subtle, wicked, hell-bent enemy of souls and against Jesus Christ in every way, shape, and form. He does not want you and I to understand what is in this gospel. It was by design that I have been late to sermons. It was by design that I stood outside of church playing tag when they was preaching the message of redemption in Lewis and Seventh Adventist Church. It was by design when my dad said to us, let's have Bible study. And I said, no. It was by design when the scriptures were open and I was born out of my brain. It was by design that when my brother said to me, two years after his baptism, I need to tell you a story. I need to tell you a story, Michael, that's going to keep you preaching till the cows come home. That's going to keep you preaching until you die. That's going to keep you telling people the truth and nothing but the truth. That's going to keep you sticking to your Bible and telling people about the love of God because there's power in the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. There's power in Jesus Christ that can be broken now, not tomorrow. I don't want people going and leaving from their seats thinking they have to go back to their chalets Go back and fight sin on their own. That their homes have to stay broken. That their mum and dads who are not in the church can't see that they have something that they need, which is the peace that comes when you know you're forgiven by Jesus Christ. And this is the story that my brother told me. Two years or a year, I can't remember too well, but it was a long time after the fact he was baptised. It was May 27, 1999, I got baptised. And I moved to my father's house to move away from my associations. How much time do you have, bro? Half, okay. To move away from the associations. I felt I have to leave. I have to leave. I don't think I'm strong enough. My friends still go partying and clubbing, and I have to go. I left. One day I was studying my Bible. I still remember to this day. Every single day I'd open the scriptures and read. And boy, it would take me a long time to understand certain things. But God was good. I would get this a little chunk out. That would keep me for the whole day. And one day, it wasn't a literal voice, but such an overwhelming conviction said, your brother. So I packed my bags and I went down to my mom's. My parents were separated when I, at, at a young age. And so I went down to my mom's and I started to speak to my brother. He wasn't baptized. He grew up in the church. But let me be straight and he would tell you this so he won't be embarrassed. He was on the devil's side fully. I'll be playing gospel music. He'll come around and turn it off. Turn off that stupid music. I had to pray. I'm playing my gospel music. He'll turn up his hip hop and his rap. Onyx, DMX, the guys that we used to listen to. I'll be praying. I spoke to him about the word every single day. Sometimes we'd be up to four in the morning arguing. I wouldn't be arguing. He'd be throwing the stones and I'd be responding, John, but there's something different about it now, John. I can't explain to you, but Christ changed my heart, John. John, yes, we grew up in church, John, but something happened, John. I said, I can't explain to you, but something happened to me, man, John. And I know it's true. John, I want you to realize this, John. There's power in the name of Jesus, John. I said, you see that angry man that should disrespect mammy? I said to mammy, I'm going to kill you, man, if you don't stop telling me what to do. You see that anger? John, there's power in the name of Jesus. I said, John, when I got my hands and knees, when I heard that sermon in Peckham Church, and he said, Jesus loves you, I said, I could. I said, man, John, I'm telling you, man, there's something. When I understood that Christ died for me, why were yet sinners? Christ died for me. 
I said I had to respond to that love because I saw there was somebody who loved me despite all my sins. Amen. And the pastor said, Mike, if you give your life, Jesus would change your heart. Did I understand intellectually how that would happen? No. Did I have any text? No. Did I have any Bible study? No. But something in my heart told me that makes sense. How many times as a seven-day Adventist did I try to keep the law of God? How many times did I try to break up with my girlfriend and I ran back like a dog runs to his vomit? Couldn't break free. I said, John, there's power. I know, I just know it. Because something has happened in my heart that the things which I hated now I love. And the things which I love now, I just hate them, John, and I can't explain how it happened, but I know it's happened. Amen. And it happened when I understood the love of Christ and the power that's in that love. I know. And so it so happens that he was leaving the room. I'm kind of long story short, kind of the details. I gave a book to him called Confrontation by Ellen G. White. I said, John, read this book. It will expose the devil and it will highlight Jesus' love for you. John said, okay. He took it. He read it. By the grace of God, he got baptized and he's still here to this day. Now you're thinking, powerful testimony. That's not the testimony. That's not the testimony. Remember I said, it was like a year after he told me something. He said, I'm going to tell you something, right? Remember? We was watching TV. He said, Mike, I need to tell you something. He turned off the TV. He's been baptized now. You know, we're, we're cool now. No more arguments. And when we did have the arguments, guess what we done? We prayed. Amen? Amen? It's not the arguments. When you have an argument with your parents, make sure you say sorry after. It's not the arguments. Where do I get that principle from? For the wage of sin is death, but the... For why are we yet sinners, Christ? Is sin the problem? Is arguments the problem in the home? Is no. Make sure you say sorry. Make sure you go to your prayer and humble yourself and say sorry if you're professing to be of Christ. Show them that they're not the enemy. I'm not the enemy. It's the devil trying to mash up our home. Yeah. Mom, let's pray, man. I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry I got angry, man. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Anyway, Jonathan said, Mike, I'm going to tell you what was happening to you when you were speaking to me. He said, when you came down and we started to sleep in the same room, and that was really strange, really, really strange for me, because my mom separated us as young boys, we used to fight all the time. And so when I went down to my mom's house, he one day wanted to sleep in my room. And I was like, that's strange. I said, okay, you can sleep in my room. And John said, you, Michael, do you know why I wanted to sleep in your room? I said, John, tell me, I don't know. He said, Mike, every single day, I was visited by a fallen angel, by a demon. John would sleep in his room on the floor because he was decorating his room, so he cleared out his mattress, he painted the wall because my brother's an artist, so he'd done these murals on the wall, like Jordan Lear, Michael Jackson, it was just like excellent, like the, looked like the real thing. So he cleared everything out, he was painting it, drawing it, and all this thing on his wall. He had all these posters, he was doing his thing. He said, while I was sleeping in the middle of the room, every single night, what did I say? Not sometime. Every single night, this demon would appear. He wasn't sleeping. He was full awake. He would have a nightmare, and he would awake. He said, my, eye, my eyes were open, my, I was awake. And this demon would appear at the, at the foot of my door, and then they would come up to me, to my face. I was like, but John, why were they doing that? Because I don't know. It was making me feel petrified. I said, John, are you, are, you, are you sure? Why am I asking, is he sure? Do I believe the devil exists? I've, ne I've never heard anything like this before. I just read it. I was like, John, he goes, Mike, an old, raggedy old woman with crazy teeth in her mouth. Crazy feature like a monster would come and visit me every single night. He told me I would want to go to my dad because I knew my dad was a Christian. Because when I was around my dad, the voices would stop. Not voices in the head, audible voices. Come, man, you 
no universe. Journal. Audible voices. Guess what this thing I started to speak by the Spirit of God, by the throw of the word, to tell him to get rid of in his life. And I never knew, remember I didn't know this was going on. This is the, the controversy, like Spirit prophecy tells us, if we could see the veil just push back, we would see the warfare that goes on daily. So I couldn't see. I couldn't see. I didn't know this was going on. I said, John, the thing I was hitting on, every single day, everything that would cause the argument, I said, get rid of that music. Get rid of that music. Get rid of that music. Get rid of that music, John. They have access into your life through that music. I said, get rid of that music, John. Get, and it, that, as soon as I talked about God, love, oh yeah, he was, he was fine. As soon as I started to hit on the idol that was holding him, saying, said, no, you don't come back here. No, you don't. That's where I have the power. Let's go to the Bible. Romans 6. Let's go to the Bible. How does Satan seek to gain access and control of the mind of man? And then we're going to come back to the testimony. How much time, bro? 15 minutes. Romans 6. Romans 6. Romans 6. Are we there, brethren? Romans 6. We're just coming to principles so we can understand why, according to the word of God, I was so convicted. I didn't understand the serious implications of it. I didn't know that demons were having access to his life. I had no understanding of that whatsoever. And I'm glad I didn't. Because I think it would have affected me how I would have behaved and what I would have done. Romans 6, verse 12. Let not what? Sin, therefore what? Rain. What's that word? Rain. rain. What imagery comes to your mind when you think of the word rain? Control. Sorry? Sorry? Control. Control, what else? King, King what else? Control. Power, take over. Right. Rain definitely takes into our minds the imagery. Think of the imagery. That's the Bible. So wonderful. It makes it so simple. The imagery, rain. King sitting on the throne. A king having dominion. Let not sin therefore what? Reign. Okay, how Paul? How Lord? How can we not let sin what? Reign. Already we're speaking victory already. This is why I love the Bible. It's everywhere. If you would just see it. It's everywhere. Let not sin therefore what? Reign. How many of you don't want it to rain? Amen. Let not sin therefore reign where? That ye should do what? Obey. Obey it. Referring to what in the context? Sin. Sin. Where does it want to reign? In the body. That you should obey it in the lusts thereof. We ain't got time. We ain't got time. Go to Galatians 5. We ain't got time. Just write this down. Galatians 5, 19 to 22. The works of the flesh are these. Adultery, fornication, and there's one word in there. Revelings. Look at the word revelings. Does anybody know what it means? Look at the word revelings. It gives you the characteristics, the words that are associated with having a party and a dance and a club and scene. Just look it up. Just look it up. Do your homework. Literally, just look it up. Look at the word revelings and all the words associated when you're having a revel. You're having a good time. It's characterized with loudness and noise. It's characterized with no dignity, no solemnity, no sacredness. It's a revel. It's a party. It's a dance. What's happening in the team tent over there? What's happening in the team tents over there? Every single one of you knows something's wrong. Every single one of you knows something is wrong. But we're silent. I'm not God, so I'm not going to make you feel bad at being, being silent. So I'm saying something because it's on my heart. Because the Bible says, don't have a revel. It's the work of the flesh. And those who do these things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But how does Satan gain access like that? Because he's mixing the sacred with the profane. Read Ezekiel 22, 26. I have a controversy with my priests. I have a controversy with my priests. Because they have not shown the difference between the holy and the unclean. If I don't tell you that that's bad food and that's good food, then you think all food is good. If I don't tell you that's holy and that's unclean, then you think everything's all right. 
Jesus warned us that in the last days, the prime deception is coming. In which name? In which name, Bible students? In the name of Islam. In the name of Hinduism. Which name? Jesus' name. Jesus says in Matthew 24, the signs to his coming. The first sign he said, let no man what? deceive you. And he qualified this statement by verse 5 by saying, for many shall come in what? My name. We should be looking for deceptions done in the name of Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 14. The Bible says, the Bible says, Satan does not come as Satan. The Bible says it. Satan does not come as Satan. He comes clothed as an angel of light. He comes to giving you a little bit of truth and giving you a little bit of error. He comes giving you the sacred and giving you the holy and the profane. Where did the idea come that we can mix holy music with ungodly music? Where did the idea come that we permitted such devilish things to happen on our campus? Where did it happen? How did it happen? Let's go. No, we don't need to go there. We don't need to go to the slide. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. How? Via the lusts. Satan is gaining control via young people. And we're sitting here unconcerned. We're so blind to it. Who did Satan blind in our first text? Those who don't believe. The reason why we allow this nonsense in our church because we don't believe there's power in the simple preaching of the word of God. We don't believe there's power in the simple explanation to the understanding that someone's convicted and they will exercise faith and call in the name of Jesus and chains will be broken. Tell my brother that it takes time to get victory and he would have been dead. When I gave him that book, Confrontation, he told me, Michael, you have no idea why I decided on that day. He says, I got so messed up in my mind, I said to myself, I'm going to take my life. He said, Mike, I decided I'm going to go and take the highest building in the area and commit suicide. When I hear things like, oh, I can't get victory, you tell that to someone who's committed suicide. You tell that to my friend that I'm doing Bible study with. He said, man, I want to overcome weed, man. I want to overcome alcohol, man. Don't worry, man. Takes time. Takes time. Matthew chapter 12. Jesus says, I cast out devils by who? I cast out devils by who? The Spirit of God. So let's continue reading in Romans 6, verse 13. Neither do what? Yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield, that just means to submit yourself unto God as those that are what? Alive from the dead and your members as what? Instruments of righteousness. The access is through submission. It's when he gave his life to Christ. It's when he read that book and saw the love of God. That saints chains were broken. How much time do I have, bro? Okay, Luke 4, 18. Luke 4, 18. Luke 4, 18. This is where victory comes. This is where victory comes, church. Luke 4, 18. The devil's not ramping. The devil's not ramping. Can we go to the next slide? Step to Christ, 17. Okay. They were seriously not ramping. Steps to Christ, page 17. We there on the slides? All right, never mind. Luke 4, 18. We all there, brethren? Now, this is Jesus speaking in context. Jesus has just been baptized with the Holy Ghost. And notice what he said. And notice what he said. The Spirit of the Lord is what? Upon me, because he has anointed me to preach what? The gospel to the poor. What's that, ne what's that symbol at the end of that sentence? Semicolon. That's good. Now, now that means Jesus is going to now explain what the preaching of the gospel is. Who is upon Christ? The Spirit of the Lord. He has anointed me. He has chosen me to preach the gospel to the poor. Notice what it says. He has sent me. 
If you want to do ministry, it's not about knowledge. Just pray and ask for the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go to your room and say, Lord, forgive me. Forgive my sins. Lord, use me what knowledge I have. You have power. Does that mean you shouldn't train? Of course not. Because there's growth. But you still have power. I'm just harnessing the power. I'm just trying to get more faithful. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because I've anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to what? Heal the brokenhearted to preach. Keep on those next words. To preach deliverance to the what? How long did it take someone to get free when Jesus preached to them? Church, how long did it take someone to get free when Jesus was talking to them? So why are we saying today that you right now, if you're struggling right now, I know what it means to struggle. I've been there. That's why I'm preaching this. This whole camp meeting, but I've been praying. I know what it means to struggle. Do you know why we struggle? I'm going to be honest with you, and I'm going to be transparent today. Do you know why we struggle? We don't want to give up. That's why it took so long to get victory. Not the victory takes long. I took long just to submit. Let me repeat myself again. It takes long because you're fighting. It takes long because I was fighting. I don't want to let go, Lord. I love this thing, man. I love it. I like doing it in the morning, in the afternoon, and the evening. And snacks in between. It took long because I didn't want to let go. The Spirit of the Lord says, Night to me to preach deliverance to who? Captain. Come on, Bible says, we know this. We've even gone to any other text. Who are they held captive by? Who are they held captive by? Satan. Our condition through sin is what? And the power that restores us must be what? That's why the Bible says you're not saved by your works. Ephesians 2, verse 8. How much time do I have? Three minutes. <laughs> I'm going to close on time. <laughs> Let me just finish reading that quote. And I pray the Holy Spirit just makes it clear to you. We ain't got time to elaborate on this. The power that restores us must be what? Supernatural. Else it has what? No value. There's but how many powers? One. One power that can break the hold of what? Evil upon the hearts of men. And that is what? The power of God in Christ Jesus. So, so we're going to end now. How do I get the power of God? Doesn't it say, doesn't it say there's one power that can break the what? The hold of what? Evil on the heart. And what's that power? What's that power? The power of God in who? Jesus. Jesus Christ. So how do I get this power? How do I get this power to break the evil on my heart? I'm struggling with evil. Don't feel bad. No, no, no. Let me say, put it this way. Don't feel hopeless. You should feel bad. You should feel very bad. Yeah, the Holy Spirit makes us feel bad. It makes us feel guilty. That makes us just see our need. But don't feel hopeless. You're supposed to struggle because you can't do it. It's a sign that you're awakened to your condition. Let me say this again. Someone who doesn't struggle, <laughs> someone who doesn't struggle is denying the Holy Ghost full right. Not someone who struggles. Let me say that again. I want to give you some hope. Someone who's struggling, Lord, Lord, help me, help me. And it doesn't happen. They fall again and again and again and again. They're trying their best. I don't want to knock sincerity. I don't want to knock you're trying. But what I want to knock according to the word of God is unbelief. Unbelief. That's why the Bible says, for by grace are you saved through what? Faith. So how quickly can we have grace? According to the text. What, as soon as what you believe. How quick is that? That's up to you. That goes back to my point. You struggle because you're struggling between doubt and faith. Whether you actually got something. Last slide. When the soul surrenders what? Itself. itself. Surrenders itself to Christ. A what? Yeah. New power takes possession of the heart. How quickly can that happen, church? As soon as you believe. A change is what? Which what? Man can never accomplish what? For himself. That's what you've been doing. You went home and you said, I'm going to study more. Then I know I'm going to get it. You went home, I'm going to do ministry, that's how I know I'm going to get it. You went home, and whatever it was, you placed your confidence in something that you can do. And you missed it. This thing is so supernatural, you think this is sci-fi. Because your feelings never changed. Let me tell you something. Let me give you this quickly, right? I'm going to finish the call. Let me give you this quickly, right? I encourage you. Let me give you this quickly. 
I believe most of us, because we all profess to be Christians, I believe most of us start struggling and failing. Do you know why? When you first gave your heart to Christ, man, you thought you were Superman, amen? amen. I heard somebody say that, Jay said that to me this week, the man thought I was Superman. There's nothing wrong with that, you know? Because you just believe in the power of God. Then you fell. And this is what the devil said. Nothing had ever happened to you when you prayed the first time. You doubted. You're like, I can't, have, I can't have been really converted because I fell. That's nonsense. Because First John 2 1 says there's a possibility that Christians can fall. Write that text down. My little children, these things are around you that you sin not. That's the standard. But the saving grace of God has put this other because he knows what material we're made of. That if any man sin, we have what? A powerful advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He puts that there because he understands the material he's working with. So don't let devil convince you that just because you've fallen is not indecisive proof that you were never converted. You were just tempted. And you gave it. You yielded. It is a supernatural work. Bringing a what type of element? Into what kind of nature? Isn't human nature good? Is human nature good? So of course we need a supernatural element. The soul that is, what's that word? Yielded to Christ becomes his what? own fortress which he holds in a revolted world and he intends that no authority shall be known in it by his own. A soul thus kept in possession by the heavenly agencies is what? Impregnable to? It's also saved. I have to make an appeal. I have to make an appeal. It's 10 o'clock. I have to make an appeal. How many of you want this supernatural element? Come to the front. Don't come believing that your feelings will change. Come believing that you're leaving with a supernatural power. And that power is the Spirit of God. Trust in the promises of Christ. For that which you've committed unto him, he will keep to the end. For he's the author and finisher of your work. What he's begun today, yes. he's promised to finish. If you fall, please don't forget that you're receiving something now. So go back in your hands and you ask God to give you the same power you're receiving now. You're receiving power right now because you've heeded the word of God. Amen. To many that received him, to them gave him power. Yes. To me that received him, to them gave you power. How do you receive Christ? Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and there they have testified for me. You receive the word. That's why you're going to receive the power, because you're believing in the word. Amen. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father in heaven, time is up, but people have responded. Bless them as you promised with the power of the Holy Spirit. That our power of your Holy Spirit to break the evil in our hearts, to give us the confidence and the assurance and the strength that Christ is in us, and we don't have to be subject to Satan and these temptations. Yes. The Bible says, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. It says, let not it. The only way we can do this is by faith and the yes. power of God. Daily, daily surrendering ourselves. Please, Father, forgive us where we have fallen. I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.